I don't think most of us would have a problem with this statement. Truth by its very nature is exclusive. It's only logical that everything can't be equally true. The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, is where Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the apostle Paul said, For there is but again one God, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. And Jesus explains that in John 30, uh, 10, verse 30, by saying, And I, I and the Father are one. God is one. Jews and Christians believe there is one God. Hindus believe there are 33. There's no way both of those things can be true. They're mutually exclusive. Exclusive, excuse me. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that is an exclusive truth. He left no ambiguity about there being only one God and one way to approach it. As illogical as it is, our postmodern world says there's no such thing as truth, meaning, certainty. Everything is relative. All points of view, all moral positions, all religious systems, all forms of art, all political movements are equally valid. Ethics, right and wrong, all depends on the situation. There is no objective standard of truth, no God of absolute truth. Now, that worldview has ruled our academic institutions for the last 50 years or so. Back in 1987, University of Chicago professor Alan Bloom wrote a hugely controversial book called The Closing of the American Mind, How Education Has Failed Democracy and Impoverished the Souls of Today's Students. Long title, but he, he nailed it. He said, almost every student entering the university already believes truth is relative. And he tells of putting it to the test in one of his philosophy classes. He he was uh, explaining to the class one day the Hindu custom of sati, which is burning a widow alive on her husband's funeral pyre. And that image will stay with you, won't it? The British banned it when they ruled India in the 1800s, but the Hindu priest said, but this is our custom. The Brits said, well, it's our custom to hang men who burn women alive. Bloom said, the students in his class, so they hear this, they are so steeped in relativism that they can only say, well, the British should have never been there in the first place. They couldn't admit that it's wrong to burn women alive. That's how thorough the brainwashing has been. And we're seeing this. I mean, we're seeing the, the, the evidence of postmodernism says there is no right answer. Everyone's equally correct. It's the very essence of freedom from constraints and rules. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there is no revelation or vision of God, the people cast off restraint. Other translations say, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. You may remember the end of the year, uh, Last year, we we talked about Oxford Dictionary announcing their word of the year for 2016. It captured the mood in America pretty well. It's post-truth. It's a bit different than relativism, but post-truth society is one in which truth takes a backseat to emotion, where feelings replace facts. (laughs) And that's where we're at right now. Obvious example was the meltdown we saw on college campuses when President Trump won the election. Even though the exit polls showed a huge percentage of eligible millennials didn't vote, many of these students couldn't handle the outcome. Their schools sent letters of condolences and canceled exams and even offered hot chocolate and hugs, you know, faced with a reality that contradicted what they felt should have happened, many just couldn't cope. A post-truth culture says disagreement is hatred. If you disagree with me, you hate me. Loving me means agreeing with me. My feelings are my identity. So contradicting how I feel is a personal attack. That's why safe spaces and trigger warnings and microaggressions came, came about feelings ran wild. We now have a generation who can't handle the truth because they've grown up denying its very existence. Jesus said, deception 
not being able to recognize what's true and what's false, would be a major sign at the end of this age. This would be when things start to swirl. When you see this coming, this is the sign of, you know, that we're nearing his second coming. So we're going to try to get a handle on this truth as, as in this study. We want to know how we can recognize it, get more truth working in our, our, our lives. And the Bible has plenty to say on the subject. In fact, I just read you the verse where the one we follow called himself the way, the capital T, truth, and the life. Jesus said that he came into the world to testify to the truth. In John 8, 32, he said, the truth will set you free. Now, a worldview is the way we think the world works and how we fit into it. The Christian or biblical worldview embraces truth as it's laid out in the Bible. It's a picture of how God sees us, himself, and the world he created. So developing a biblical worldview means learning to see all of life through God's eyes, through the lens of God's eyes. Genesis to Revelation is God's objective truth. It's not somewhat true, true in part, true for me, but not necessarily for you. The truth Christians believe is based on what God's revealed in his written word in Christ, who is the living word, and to us personally by the Holy Spirit. With the Christian faith, we have real knowledge and objective truth. The good news in America is the worldview is still a choice. We're not in North Korea. Nobody's holding a gun to our head. I mean, we, still, uh, we can still believe in whatever we want, even in nothing at all if we so choose. In fact, even God doesn't force belief on us. He created us in his image, endowed us with a free will, leaves it totally up to us as to what we believe or refuse to believe. I think it would be helpful to just run through a few of the worldviews that our nation is embracing right now so that we're staying clear and we're, we're able to recognize them. They're everywhere we turn. They're in the media, advertising online, at work, in classrooms conversations with friends. This is the stuff we're running into. Materialism is the view that says the only thing that matters is the acquisition of stuff. It's the idea that if I have more, I'm worth more. Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. In other words, don't judge your value by your valuables. Life isn't about your stuff. The greatest things in life are not things. In Matthew 6, 20, Jesus said, store up for yourself treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Second worldview can be summarized in the words, me first. It's called individualism, living by what's right for you. Jesus taught the reverse of that, saying that you only start to live when you give your life away. Significance comes from serving God and others. He said, you'll find your life by letting go of it. Here it is in Matthew 16, 25. If you try to keep your life for yourself, make it all about you, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find true life. All right, hedonism is number three. It's the worldview that makes us, uh, that makes comfort and fun the supreme goal in life. Now, this may surprise you. You know, God's all for us having fun. He made, you know, he came up with the idea. He put the desire in us to don a pair of skis and shush down a mountain slope. I spent four days, you know, a couple weeks ago doing that, you know, woo-hoo and screaming my lungs out, you know, just uh, having a blast, thanking God for giving people the ingenuity to come up with ski lifts and (laughs) just the whole thing thinking, Lord, this is just amazing. But you know what I found out? Four days, I was done. You know, every activity, every human activity gets old because ultimately, the true pleasure we seek is found in loving God and doing what he's called us to do. Pleasure as an end goal, very sad, empty pursuit. Proverbs 21, 17 says, you're addicted to thrills? (laughs) What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. It's the reason Mick Jagger's been singing, I can't get no satisfaction for more than 50 years, you know? (laughs) He's been at it. You will never be satisfied seeking pleasure. Solomon exhausted himself doing it, and it left him empty, and he wrote about it. The next worldview is called pragmatism. 
And it's summed up in the theme, whatever works for you. And in our pluralistic world, I mean, this one's real popular right now because nobody wants to tell anybody they're wrong. In fact, the only thing wrong these days is to tell somebody they're wrong. I find it interesting, you know, how this tolerance movement is totally intolerant of anybody who doesn't embrace their tolerance ideology. I mean, it's, it's crazy. You have to stay politically correct. You know, you have to always say the right thing. But here's, here's the problem. There are plenty of things in life that work, but they're evil. Like spreading a rumor about somebody to get their promotion or selling inferior merchandise to lie in your pockets. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. You can say, well, I don't believe that's true. But you're not believing it. Doesn't make it any less true than refusing to believe in gravity enables you to fly. You can jump off the Empire State Building halfway down. Somebody else, how's it going out there? You can say, so far, so good. There's even a nice breeze. <laughs> See, that's the essence of that scripture. There's a way that seems right, but it's the middle of the fall. The end is a deadly splat. When you're cheating on your spouse or getting strung out on drugs, things start off feeling great. I meet people all the time whose marriages are headed for a breakdown. Their businesses, their health, their relationships are going south. They're saying, so far, so good. They're not feeling the pain. Yet, the Bible says the wages of sin is death every time. And whatever you sow, you also reap. That's an inevitable law of life in this world. That's just the way God set it up. The next worldview is called naturalism or atheism. It's a belief that everything in life is just the result of random chance. There's no grand creator. Even if God did exist, he doesn't. He doesn't care, you know, he doesn't really matter because reality is just, it's coincidence. He's, he's hands off on this thing. The Bible says in Romans 1.20 that God's eternal power and character cannot be seen, but from the beginning of creation, God has shown what these are like by all that he's made. He shows us himself, in other words, in what he does. We can look at God's book of nature and see a lot about who he is. His creation tells us that he, he is powerful, he's ingenious, that he likes beauty and diversity and organization without even reading the Bible. I mean, we can see what God's like in all that he's made. And the more science uncovers, the more difficult it is to deny his design and creation. In fact, we've got a video for you that just shows the intricacy. Now that we've got microscopes that you know, can just see into uh, the, the, the anatomy of his creation, it's incredible. Let's watch this. Just the intricacy, the complexity. I mean, you ought to look this guy up. He's a scientist, Christian scientist by the name of Behe, who is just blowing the doors off of, you know, Darwinism. Stephen, Dr. Stephen Meyer is a philosopher of science, and he says, neo-Darwinism will not be able to survive the biology of the 21st century. And it's already happening. Already, I was listening to a, a, one of the leading scientists the other day who had just come from one of the big think gatherings of the you know, scientific community. He said the majority of the scientific community have rejected uh, uh, evolutionism as, uh, uh, on the basis of you know, intelligent design being way, way, way too evident in the makeup of the cosmos. I mean, in every part, both the macro and micro levels. The, the implausibility that this could have all just happened. Now, listen to hours of this stuff. It is fascinating what, you know, they are discovering. It's just blowing the doors off the myth of evolution. Humanism believes I'm my own God. I'm master of my own fate. And that's not new either. It was the original temptation Satan used on Adam and Eve. He said, do this and you'll be gods. So let's follow that logic. If we were even tiny, mini-me gods, don't you think we would have solved at least some of our problems? I mean, we only seem to create more chaos because we're not God. God wired us to worship someone greater than ourselves. If we don't worship him, we'll find something or someone else. Romans 1.25 says, they, speaking of the humanist of his day, exchanged the truth of God for a lie. 
and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator. I mean, you still can travel to places. You see them on the documentaries, you know, places all over the world where people worship little idols of stone and wood. Now, we've progressed way beyond that. Here in America, we, we worship our cars and our houses and tech toys. But all those things make terrible gods because they break down and have to be replaced. And it's really sad when you're doing better than your God. And finally, the worldview that we embrace is called the theism, which says God made me for his purpose. Colossians 1.16 says everything above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in it. It was all made by God for God. And until we understand that, life will never make sense. I love, you know, Rick Warren's opening line, The Purpose Driven Life. It's not about you. Have you ever heard anybody say that, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere? Really? I've been sincerely wrong on multiple occasions. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was going to work. I, 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 I was confident it would work, but it didn't work. Wrong is wrong even when I'm sincere. I mean, if you're a pilot flying in a cloud bank, sincerely thinking a mountain's not there can get you sincerely dead. True is always true. Another myth says, yeah, it all depends on the circumstance. I mean, you can believe one thing in one situation, something completely different in another, but going with whatever's convenient at, at the time, you know, I mean, uh, that's, that's going to lead to incredible confusion and stress. Truth is always true. Reality doesn't change. In fact, the whole discipline of science is built on studying the amazing consistency of the universe, how God just timed it and, 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 and sink this thing into just such precision. The Bible tells us that what we believe matters because it shapes our lives. Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. If there are things in your life you want to change, it happens from the inside out. You have to first change your thoughts. Knowing what we believe matters because Proverbs 29.18 says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they're most blessed. This isn't rocket science. I mean, if you want a blessed life, you have to pay attention to what your creator reveals and get your thinking in line with his truth instead of popular opinion, instead of what's going on in the culture. And you want to be able to explain it to others. First Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account of the hope that's in you, but do it courteously and respectfully. Now, we're in a soup right now. Most people don't have a clue. They're a jumble of all these different worldviews. They, they can see the countries coming unglued. They can see our schools are in crisis and businesses are struggling to survive. And then our economy is strapped with a $20 trillion debt. Who thought that was a good idea? We're stressed out. We're depressed. We're oppressed. And we keep doing all the things that just are leading to it. The church is, you know, caught in the middle going, yeah, what in the world's going on? We've, been a, we've got to be able to answer that question for ourselves and be able to explain it to others. And so if we pull out of this, here's where it starts, with us learning the truth. Now, you know, this just rubber hits the road. You've got to read the book. You've got to get a Bible reading plan and go through the whole thing. Do it this year. There are some great plans out there, very simple to understand translations. This is way, way easier than it sounds. Uh, you can even have it read to you. YouVersion is one of my favorite apps. Every day, I, I have my devotional. You got, I see Mike saying the same. I have my devotional read to me. And uh, you, you can even do it on the way to work. And uh, do it in a translation that you can understand. Ask the guys in our bookstore to get, help you find a translation that'll work for you. Study Bibles are excellent. I mean, some of them have, you know, big margins that you can write in. So are our Bible study classes. We have classes that go through the Bible. And I would also, I would add this to that. Read some cr books by Christian authors who can help you wrap your head around the social and political issues of our day. I constantly try to keep myself entertained with good Christian authors. 
Uh, two of my favorites uh, right now, I'm always finding a new one, are Eric Metaxas and, of course, of course one of my old favorites is Hugh Ross. Uh, they're both listed in the bulletin along with a couple of places to check out on, your, on YouTube that you can watch. Uh, I asked our, our bookstore to get Eric's books, uh, the two that I just finished, uh, Miracles. Oh, my goodness, this thing will, you talk about encouraging you, sharing stories of the miraculous. And uh, the other one was called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About God But Were Afraid to Ask. It's really comical. I mean, you'll enjoy that one, too. The one I'm reading right now, I can't think of the guy's name, but it's, the, the title is Well-Versed. Uh, we, we've ordered those, and they'll be in in another week. Now, here's why I'm, I'm saying this. You know, I found out when I was trying to get my food addiction under control that the only way to do it is you have to have snacks readily available, carrot sticks and all kinds of other things. Because when your body is going, feed me, you know, if you throw in some hummus and carrot sticks, you can get full, and your body says, oh, okay. Now, now it had rather have had candy or cookies, but, but it's just as full. In fact, you'll feel full faster if you do that. So, so the key to me was you have to have food. You have to have the food available. It's got to be in the refrigerator. It's got to be where, you know, the bad stuff used to be. The key to breaking an entertainment addiction, which is where we're all at right now, is the same principle. Have alternate material to read and listen to available. Always, you know, it's all about the prep. I always try to have a book that I'm in, that I'm in the middle of. You know, I'm listening to it on Audible or I'm going through it in my Kindle. Always. I, I try to stay in the middle of a book so that there's always that alternative. There's always, because, you know, I go brain dead just like you. What am I going to do? Well, I ought to go just turn on the TV and veg out. And that will happen if you don't have a plan. Jesus said his disciples would be salt and light in the world, even a bizarre one like ours. We're his answers, uh, answer to the darkness, to the corruption uh, that are set on destroying our family and friends and neighbors and coworkers. We cannot stay silent. In the days ahead, we want to learn the truth so we can live by it and communicate it. We want to be able to say to people, yeah, there's cause and effect for what you're dealing with. I mean, there's a reason for this craziness that we're seeing. Have you ever seen uh, one of those buildings designed in the postmodern deconstruct, uh, deconstructivist uh, view of reality? They're characterized by, uh, you're seeing examples there, ideas of fragmentation to reflect the unpredictability and the chaos of life The Wexner Center for Arts in Ohio they, it has staircases that go nowhere and pillars supporting nothing, and they're pretty wild to look at, but none of them ever deconstructed their foundations. They wouldn't dare. And Jesus talked about the importance of foundations in the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, 24, he said, if you work these things in your life, now this is the message paraphrase, and I love this. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. <laughs> like that. He says, look, you're either going to build on what God says our popular opinion. It's one or the other. And if you do the latter, your life is going to crumble the minute things get tough. But if you build on the unchanging truth in my word, you won't be moved. We all experience the earthquakes of life. I mean, the older you get, if you're past 40, you've already gone through several. Financial earthquakes, health earthquakes, relational, career, moral earthquakes. They shake us to the core. And if our foundation is built on the latest trend or how we feel in the moment, I can tell you right now we're going to cave. Jesus predicted that men's hearts would be failing them out of fear and panic as time begins to come to a close. He said, when, when you see these things, men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear. What are we dealing with epidemic right now? Panic disorder. It's all across our 
country. I mean, people are, are uh, on every kind of medication imaginable trying to get back control. He said, but if you, if you want to if you want solidity, build on the eternal truths of Scripture, and those storms won't break you. They won't break you. I shared with you, you know, the verses of Scripture that have anchored me and pulled me back from the brink. Proverbs 23, 23 says, Learn the truth and never reject it. Get wisdom, self-control, and understanding. John 14, 17, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is our helper in this. He called him the Spirit of truth who lives in us to help us grow in the knowledge of God. But it's not automatic. You, you, you don't get a gigantic information download the day you're born again. You know, Bible reading and Bible study are a spiritual discipline that produces knowledge and wisdom over time. And that means you, you got to find the off button on your iPad and your cell phone. You know, you've got to put time... A, Set time aside. We are so addicted to watching stuff and being entertained. Those quick hits, you know, of dopamine and adrenaline. One New Testament author says, guys, it's hard to teach you anything because you're not prepared to learn. Then he says in Hebrews 5.11, he says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish or discern good from evil. One of the things that has so encouraged me over these past months and years is to see you guys, to see the heart change that is taking place here at Grace to see your hearts gravitating toward truth and teaching. I'm, I'm teaching longer, I'm, and, and, and instead of pushback, it's more, more, which just says so much about what God is doing in your heart. Number two, in these evil days, Jesus wants us to be discerning when it comes to what's true and what's false. First John 4, 1 says, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying teachers loose in the world. Now, if that was true back then, imagine where we're at. John says, look, there are people out there who are just plain liars. They make up stuff. They say things. That they're speaking for God. They're not speaking for God. Learn the truth so you can recognize it. Don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. You know, I mean, get a grip on truth for yourself. So you know, uh-uh, uh-uh, that is not in the Bible. Or that was not the right quotation of that verse, you know. Check out what I say. See if it lines up with God's Word. Teachers come and go. What matters is truth. Don't just listen, examine everything. In the light of the Bible, that is the only source of eternal truth. Now this all, number three, this all involves turning away from worthless amusement and diversions to the Word. Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, which is any worldview other than God's. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's will for your life is good, pleasing, perfect. It's progressive. His worldview over time will renew your mind. It'll transform your life. I love the message paraphrase of that. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. That's his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God says that turning away from the world, that is a choice you make. Proverbs 15, 14 says it this way, a wise person is hungry for the truth while fools feed on trash. That's our choice. It's either truth or trash. I mean, this is this week. Just try logging how much time you actually spend being entertained and how much time you spend feeding your mind on the truth. I think it'll shock you. And make some adjustments. Just, you know, like I said, get a good book that you start. Get a Bible reading plan that you start. Have a prayer meeting that you attend. I mean, set a goal to have a daily appointment with the Lord. All right, 
Here's the last thing. Make concerning yourself with God's agenda your life goal. Luke 12, 31, Jesus said, God will give you all you need from day to day if you make the kingdom of God your primary number one concern. How many number ones can you have? It's not a trick question. <laughs> one. God doesn't share his throne with anything or anybody. Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. He didn't say you shouldn't. He said you couldn't. You can only have one number one. Jesus said, put me first, I'll take care of all the rest of your life. Here's what I see happening. We're heading into a huge storm that has already begun. This past election has just flushed it out into the open. I mean, we are seeing insanity in our nation. We're seeing a new normal of increased darkness and violence, of increased trouble and demonic activity. I mean, every... Uh, it seems like the travel channel has turned into the demon channel. I mean, it's, it's nothing but, you know, ghosts and demons and darkness. And I mean, it's just one thing after another. We're just seeing it uh, increased perversion in everything that we turn on. Pornography is, has just gone ballistic. But as it's emerging, there's a new normal rising in the body of Christ. There's a new vitality and hunger for prayer and truth. God is preparing his church for the release of his glory in the earth. I believe that's what's happening. The devil is raging. I mean, we have a tsunami coming at us. But Isaiah 59, 19, look at this. This tells us, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Right in the next chapter, Isaiah 62, it, this is talking about this vortex hour when, when all of this comes together. He says, for behold, the darkness, the perversion, violence, trouble of all kinds shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But at the same time, right at the same time, the Lord will arise over you, his people, and his glory will be seen upon you. God will reveal his power openly through his people when the darkness is most intense. One of the huge dangers that we're facing is the way this is going to confuse people. Many believers will be disoriented by just the increasing trouble, like, what's happening? What's happening? If they've never heard this taught, if they've never read the Bible enough to understand, Jesus predicted this. He said, this is what you're to watch and pray about. When you see this happen, when you begin to, to see these things take place, wake up. Get on your knees. The trouble is, is going to confuse most Christians. Without a biblical storyline, none of it's going to make sense. And all the confusion, all the voices giving their opinions, they'll get offended at God, and they'll start to buy the secular narrative if they don't know the truth. And that's why it's so critical that we know the truth. That's why we've got to stay clear-headed. This is all about Jesus' command to stay awake to what's happening and pray. It's why we're, we've got... Uh, Joel Richardson coming in next weekend. And, uh, and let me just say this while, while I'm talking about him. He's not going to do, do just one message. We're going to give him, this guy is brilliant. I'm telling you, he is brilliant. We, we sat, our, our pastoral team sat for three and a half hours with him when he was here this last time. Jaw-dropping brilliant. I mean, he was saying things. I have read those verses, and I never saw any of that. He's put verses together and with such clarity, and, and he has respect now throughout the uh, theological world, and uh, so, so we're gonna, he's going to do three different services. I want us to get a fix on Israel and where this is going, that, that the centrality of Israel and the anti-Semitism that is about to come on us like we have never seen. What? what is up and where this is going and the history of it. His book, When a Jew Rules the World, Blow Your Mind. It's, it's amazing. So we'll do three different services. He'll have Q&A after the Saturday service and after the second Sunday service. We'll have a short time of Q&A here.